It was said of St. Thomas that as a child he was so holy and virtuous that it seemed as if he was free of original sin. That is, St. Thomas Aquinas. When a famine broke out in the city, his family had a castle in, it was said that he gave away so much food and provisions to the poor that people worried that he would literally give everything they had away. One time his father caught him on his way to give food to the poor beggars outside the walls of the castle and angrily commanded Thomas to open the cloak that was carrying the provisions. When Thomas opened it, the food miraculously turned into sweet-smelling flowers, and his father, seeing that Thomas was evidently doing the will of God, repented and let Thomas continue to feed the poor. When Thomas decided to join the Dominicans, his mother was extremely upset and angry with him, for she wanted him to join the prestigious Benedictine Abbey of Monte Cassino since his uncle was the abbot and would presumably make Thomas the abbot in years to come. Due to his insistence on joining the Dominicans, she had him locked into a tower and sent his two sisters every day to try and convince him to forget his idea of joining the Dominicans. However, after meeting with Thomas a few times, one of his sisters ended up deciding to join religious life herself. His mother, becoming even more upset by the fact that St. Thomas's sister had joined his side, sent his two brothers to try and convince him. By diabolical inspiration, his brothers decided to send a prostitute to Thomas's tower in order to dissuade him from religious life in any respect if he wasn't going to do it with the Benedictines. The prostitute, however, ran out of the tower screaming after Thomas brandished a glowing hot fire poker. After she ran away, Thomas knelt in prayer and fell asleep from exhaustion. He dreamt that two angels appeared and tied a cincture around his waist, and the pain was so great that he woke up with a loud yell. This was an angelic cincture of chastity, and after this, he admits to having never suffered even the slightest impure thought for the rest of his life. God gave Thomas this singular grace in order that Thomas might be the great doctor and theologian he was. For, as Thomas teaches us, impurity is one of, if not the greatest, dullers of the intellect. The other greatest duller of the intellect, of course, is pride. Unsurprisingly, then, St. Thomas revealed to a confessor that God preserved him from any and all temptations of pride as well. This was, again, so that his intellect would be like that of an angel. Thus, he is called the angelic doctor. This title is fitting for him, for St. Thomas teaches us, when angels see something in their intellect, they immediately grasp it in its entirety and have perfect knowledge of it. Thomas's intellect was so sharp that it truly seemed as if he did, in fact, have the intellect of an angel. For during the year that he was in the tower, he memorized the entire Bible, among other things. When he was finally freed and sent to the university where the Dominicans were trained, it was said that he knew more than all of his fellow students and even most of his teachers, and thus he kept silent in class out of humility. This earned Thomas the nickname, the dumb ox, since everyone thought he was silent on account of stupidity. One fellow student felt so bad for Thomas that he offered to tutor Thomas, and Thomas accepted the kind help out of humility. However, as Chesterton put it, Thomas's love for truth overpowered his great humility, and on one difficult topic, the tutor made a mistake, and Thomas explained the difficult topic to the tutor with perfect clarity. The student then begged Thomas to be his tutor instead. St. Albert the Great, one of the teachers of St. Thomas, had Thomas defend one of the most difficult theses in front of the entire school, and Thomas did so with such ease that Albert remarked that although they had called him the dumb ox, his bellows would resound throughout the world. This prophecy, of course, came true in spades, for again, St. Thomas is the doctor of the church. Moreover, as we will discuss later on, his bellows reached so far that all of modern philosophy can be described purely in reference to him. But more on that later. It was said that when St. Thomas had books written, he would have four scribes, each writing a different book for Thomas in four corners of the room. Thomas would take turns watching, walking to each one, dictating what to write for maybe a paragraph or so, and then move on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one managing to keep his train of thought for four different works intact at the same time. And if anyone here has read St. Thomas's work, he can attest that these books of his are not exactly light reading. 
St. Thomas would go to monasteries and friaries of different religious communities to debate. And they would kick him out because he would take on all of their theologians at once and shred their arguments with such kindness, gentleness, and charity that it just drove them crazy. He was also a holy mystic. He was known to levitate and break into ecstasy while celebrating Mass. He healed several people while he was still alive, and of course, after he died as well. One night, he was writing his commentary on Isaiah, and the secretary heard several voices coming from his room. St. Thomas left his room, and the secretary saw that no one else left the room. He then asked Thomas who the other voices were. St. Thomas said he would tell him, but only if he promised to tell no one until after his death. Thomas said that Saints Peter and Paul appeared and explained the passage to him. However, not only would Saints Peter and Paul appear to Thomas regarding his writing, but so would Christ himself on at least three separate occasions to confirm to Thomas that Thomas was writing accurately. On the last appearance of Christ, Christ said to Thomas, You have written well of me, Thomas. What would you have as your reward? Thomas said, Nothing but thee, Lord. St. Thomas once told St. Bonaventure that his greatest source of knowledge was not books, but the crucifix. And when in need of an answer to difficult questions, he would pray before a crucifix, petition his guardian angel, and even put his ear to the tabernacle. He did this so much that one time his guardian angel appeared to him to tell him that certain things are to remain mysteries until one goes to heaven and to stop asking him. Pope Urban IV, who instituted the Feast of Corpus Christi, asked St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure to each compose a sequence for the Mass. And after writing them, they both went to the Pope, and St. Thomas read his first. By the time Thomas finished, Bonaventure, having been literally enraptured by the beauty of Thomas's words, had ripped up his own piece, for in his opinion, it was nothing compared to what Thomas had written. But alas, even Thomas would cease writing and said even that what he himself wrote was all but straw after having received a vision from heaven. When St. Thomas was dying and made his general confession, the confessor left the room in tears and said that Thomas's confession was like that of a five-year-old. At the Council of Trent, his Summa Theologia was put on the altar next to the Bible, and many of the canons of the Council of Trent were almost lifted verbatim from the Summa. Pope after Pope after Pope has given approbation to Thomism and the works of Thomas, for he gives us an intellectual framework by which we can view reality with unmatched clarity and sufficient distinctions, something which no other philosophical system can claim. Now, it is worth mentioning that neither Thomas's teaching nor Thomism are novel or somehow a rupture from the philosophical and theological thought of the church in the past, as some try to say. On the contrary, it was said that Thomas knew and humbly respected the fathers so much that it was as if he inherited all of their knowledge and intellects. When the Pope commissioned him to put together the Catina Aurea, a verse-by-verse compilation of gospel commentaries from over 80 church fathers, he knew the fathers so well that he did the entire thing from memory. In fact, his veneration for the fathers was so great that when him... And one of his Dominican brothers approached Paris and saw the beautiful city. The brother said to Thomas, what I would give to have that city. St. Thomas replied by saying that he would give the entire city just to have the one missing page from St. John Chrysostom's commentary on Matthew. St. Thomas is thus often described as the culmination and perfection of the fathers. And thus, as one author puts it, when one reads St. Augustine, through his brilliance, one can still see a fallen man. In Thomas's writing, it seems as if God could have written it himself. So, when someone says that they don't really like Thomas, but prefer to go back to the sources, that is, the fathers, your alarm bell should start going off because such a statement shows that this person understands neither Thomas nor the fathers. Now, as anyone who has studied the history of philosophy can tell you, all of modern philosophy that is, from Descartes onwards, can be described as one giant revolt against the philosophy of St. Thomas. As the great philosopher, theologian, and priest of the 20th century, Cornelio Fabro, who specialized in the more platonic aspects of Thomas, so comprehensively proves in his 1,200-page book, God in Exile, modernism in the church and widespread atheism have their roots in modern philosophy, starting most proximately with Descartes, 
And the degree to which the subsequent modern philosophers departed from Thomas is the degree to which they further contributed to the spread of modernism and atheism in our times. Descartes denied Thomas's teaching that knowledge starts with the senses, and he opened the door to rationalism and skepticism, saying that we cannot trust our senses, but only our own minds. David Hume went further and denied Thomas's distinctions in causality, since he said that since we can't see causality in the same way that we can see a pool table, perhaps, we therefore cannot say we know whether or not causality exists. And for example, whether one pool ball hitting another pool ball causes the second pool ball to move. Nor can we rationally predict how it will move. Even if we have gotten the same result every single time we have tried it in the past. This is David Hume. It is worth noting that before David Hume, just about no philosophers doubted God's existence, at least after Christ, that is, since St. Thomas's arguments from causality so comprehensively prove God's existence. The only way out of St. Thomas's arguments is to doubt causality itself. In a nutshell, David Hume basically says that it's as irrational to believe in God as it is to believe that if you drop a ball, it will fall. I'll let you judge the veracity of that argument. Kant, being influenced by both, started to turn the basis for reality from the objective to the subjective. And then eventually, with modern phenomenology, we have that re reality is less about, well, reality. That is, objective reality in the outside world, but merely my perception of it and the phenomena it causes in my mind. That's the real reality, all in my head, they say. There are, of course, countless more examples but the point is that all of this modern philosophy is, even according to their own words, a violent revolt against Thomas. Descartes said that he wanted to be the new father of philosophy, replacing Aristotle and Thomas. Hume said he wanted to do away with the nonsensical metaphysics of Thomas. We could go on, but you get the point. So, how has this philosophical revolution against Thomas influenced the church? Well, as Pope St. Pius X put it, modernism is the wedding of Catholicism and modern philosophy. Modern philosophy is a revolt against Thomas, and thus modernism is a revolt against Thomas, among other things. All of the modernists either hated St. Thomas, or, as in the case of many of the influential theologians of Vatican II, they tried to reconcile Thomas with the modern philosophers who themselves rejected Thomas. But as Thomas teaches us, two contraries can't exist in the same thing at the same time and in the same respect. That is, you can't reconcile Thomas with modern philosophers who reject Thomas and systematically start with contrary premises and principles. You can't wed Christ and Bayel because everything Bayel stands for is a rejection of Christ. Similarly, you can't wed Thomas and the moderns because everything the moderns stand for is a rejection of Thomas. Thus, the so-called neo-Thomists of the 20th century, such as Karl Rahner, von Balthasar, Yves Congar, Gilson, Chenu, Skillebex, Maritain, Dulubach, Kuhn, and all of those types, to varying degrees, of course, are not real Thomists. But rather, as Father, Father Gary Goulagrange of Holy Memory put it, philosophical schizophrenics. Now, just as virtually all of the modern errors of the day can be traced back to a rejection of Thomas, by going to Thomas, we will be able to find the answers to these errors. And just as there is nothing new under the sun, every ancient error that has resurfaced again in modern times can be answered again by Thomas in the same way that he answered those very same errors 800 years ago. Let us now conclude by quickly considering a few of the modern errors that we all come across today and show how Thomas helps us refute them. St. Thomas helps us refute atheism. For the atheists say that everything came forth from nothing, and this could happen without a God. Using St. Thomas, we know that such a statement is absolutely absurd, and here is why. As Catholics, we say that God brought something from nothing. Atheists say that nothing brought something from nothing. But if nothing brought something from nothing, that means nothing caused the bringing forth. But if nothing is a cause, it's no longer nothing, but something, namely a cause. Which means that they are logically required to say that a cause brought forth something from nothing. Because a cause must be proportional to its effect, as St. Thomas teaches us and shows, if the effect, namely bringing something from nothing, 
takes infinite power, since the gap between nothing and something is infinite, then the cause must have infinite power. The only thing anyone would or could describe as having infinite power is God. Now, an atheist might object and say, very clever, St. Thomas, but you're just engaging in word manipulation and sophistry. Since I'm not saying that nothing as an entity is the cause, but rather that there was simply no cause, that is, that there was no cause for something coming from nothing. Rather, as Dawkins puts it, because the gap between something and nothing is so small, it just jumped out from nothing into existence. This statement from Dawkins, however, is logically incoherent on two accounts. Firstly, because if it jumped into existence from nothing, that means that it was the cause of its own existence, which means that there then is a cause, not no cause. Secondly, as St. Thomas teaches us, to say that something caused itself, that is, it did not exist, and then brought out its own existence, is absolutely ridiculous, because causes precede effects. If it did not exist, and then caused itself to exist, it must have already existed, since something that does not exist can't be a cause. And causes must be in existence in order to cause anything. In other words, as Thomas says, going from non-being to being requires a cause. It cannot cause itself, since that would violate the principle of non-contradiction. If it is a cause, it is a being. If it needs to be caused, it is non-being. You can't be both in being and non-being at the same time. Therefore, nothing can bring about its own existence from nothing. And again, because the gap between nothing and something is infinite, infinite power is required, and thus we have God. St. Thomas helps us refute evolution, for he proves that the effect cannot exceed the cause. In other words, you cannot give what you don't have. Someone who only has $10 can only give $10. Similarly, inorganic material, which does not have life, cannot magically mutate to somehow give life and make organic material. You can't give life unless you have it. Thus, it is just as likely that lifeless inorganic material would magically mutate into living organic material as it is that if I were to spill a glass of milk on the floor, it would spell the words of the Summa Theologia. It's impossible because the effect cannot exceed the cause. And to all those who subscribe to theistic evolution and somehow try to say that Thomas and evolution are compatible, St. Thomas says in the Summa, that what the Bible says in Genesis regarding everything happening in the Garden of Eden is to be taken as a literal and historical account of the events which took place. That is, God created Adam and Eve exactly how Genesis says, not from billions of years of evolution. St. Thomas helps us refute Teilhard de Chardin and all other similar theories that say that God is evolving and becoming better and better until the so-called omega point is reached. If this evolution is true, this would mean, according to St. Thomas, that God is not perfect, since if you are perfect, you cannot improve over time. You're already perfect. No room to improve. That's the definition of perfection. So, for Teilhard de Chardin, God is not really perfect until he's at the omega point, which means that he believes in an imperfect God, which, St. Thomas teaches us, is really no God at all. Lastly, and most controversially perhaps, St. Thomas helps us refute a particular idea being spread by a certain well-known layperson who has written many books about theology of the body, that the conjugal act is somehow this very sacred and high form of prayer and worship in and of itself, and an image of the Most Holy Trinity. On the contrary, St. Thomas teaches us that what we have in common with God, that is, what makes us made in his image and likeness, is our possession of immaterial faculties, namely the intellect and the will. And this is because God is immaterial. Our lower faculties and appetites, such as our generative faculty and sexual appetites, are base in that which we have in common with the animals. They are beastly, not bad, not evil. They're good in themselves, but nonetheless beastly and animalistic. Thus, to say that the sexual act and sexuality are somehow an image of the Trinity or the Godhead is absolutely backwards since it is the part of man that is precisely not in common with God, according to St. Thomas. Likewise, prayer consists primarily in the raising of the higher faculties to God. To say that the conjugal act in itself is a form of prayer is obviously false because animals cannot pray.
Furthermore, this ridiculous notion of the conjugal act being a form of worship and prayer in itself is exactly what the pagans who practice temple prostitution believe. Using Thomas's terms, the two beliefs, that is, the beliefs of this particular lay author, that the conjugal act is itself a prayer, and the beliefs of the pagans who practice temple prostitution, believing that it was a form of prayer, are essentially the same, but differ only accidentally. That is, both believe that the conjugal act, when done in the context that God or the gods like, is a window to the divine. They only disagree about the context that God or the gods like. One says this prayer can only be done by couples in the bedroom who are married. The other say it must be done in the temples with prostitutes. St. Thomas refuted the errors of the pagans in the past, and he will do so again. Now, one may object and say that we are made in the image of likeness in God with respect to the primacy of Christ, that is, having our bodies made like unto his body, and thus we have bodies in common with Christ, not just our immaterial faculties. But let us recall that Christ was celibate and did not engage in the conjugal act, even though he had a body. If it was such a high form of prayer in itself, why deprive himself of honoring his father in this way? Why did the Blessed Virgin Mary and well over 99% of the canonized saints deliberately deprive themselves of this particular high form of prayer? Now, one may also object and observe that it is true that it is meritorious to render the marital debt. But, using St. Thomas' distinctions, we know that it is not meritorious qua the act itself or in virtue of the act itself, but only in virtue of rendering due justice to one's spouse under the virtue of justice. Thus, the act is not meritorious in itself. Lastly, one might object that the conjugal act is sacred because it is a participation in God's creative power and the bringing forth of children who are made in the image and likeness of God. But again, using St. Thomas's distinctions, it is only sacred in terms of its effect, that is, the bringing of children and the participation of creation, not in its means, that is, the conjugal act itself. While we could go on, I think the point is clear. When in need of answering modern errors and defending the faith, go to Thomas. As they say, ite ad tomam. The popes have repeated it over and over. Regarding the place of Thomism, that is the philosophy of St. Thomas, as the philosophy of the church, which it is, one might object that the church has not solemnly defined Thomism as the philosophy of the church, although the popes have called it such. But... This is not because it is not true that Thomism is the philosophy of the church, but only because it would then be a matter of faith that Thomism is the philosophy of the church, not a matter of reason. In other words, reason is sufficient to establish Thomism as the true and most accurate philosophical system, and thus the philosophy of the church. Church definitions are for matters of faith, and faith is not necessary for this. But nonetheless, in the encyclical Doctoris Angelici, Pope St. Pius X warned that the teachings of the Church cannot be understood without the basic philosophical underpinnings of Aquinas' major theses. Quote, The capital theses in the philosophy of St. Thomas are not to be placed in a category of opinions capable of being debated one way or another, but are to be considered as the foundations upon which the whole science of natural and divine things is based. If such principles are once removed or in any way impaired, it must necessarily follow that the students of the sacred sciences will ultimately fail to perceive so much as the meaning of the words in which the dogmas of divine revelation are proposed by the magistracy of the church. End quote. We must reject the modern philosophy that the modernists have tried to wed to Catholicism in place of Thomas and Thomism and go back to Thomas if we are to fix the mess that we are in with respect to modernism. For, as the popes have said, Thomas is the antidote to modernism. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us.